Fano, fano. Oh, haramai te toki. Haumie, huie, taiki. Ah. I te tuahe tahi ngā mihi ki ngā tangata whenua o tēnei rohi, ara ngā tangata warurong. Um, nāna nei nā rātou te whenua, nā rātou te mana, nā rātou te kaitiakitanga o tēnei wā. Um, just started off, uh, I did a little chant at the start, it's calling people together, it's whanau whanau haramai te toki. Uh, come together, come together, give me my axe, let's work together to make a waka. So it's that spirit of open sports kind of thing. And then I pay tribute to the, the people of this land. Uh, it's their land, they're the guardians of it. We're here on, under their permissions. Um, so I don't want to step on their mana. So in, in uh, Māori culture, the first thing you do when you're meeting someone is you introduce yourself. Uh, there's a whole kind of like letting people know who you are, where you're from, you know, and you find out that your aunties, uncles, brothers, cousin was your wife's, you know, you get a whole big picture, you situate yourself in the world, you're making those connections. So I'll do that. Um, I'm probably one of the palest Māoris you'll see. They're, we, we call ourselves stealth Māoris, we can blend in and colour. Um, I'm from, uh, I, I, I fuck a papa, I, I, my genealogy is from the bottom of the South Island. Uh, if you know New Zealand, from Tuatapere, down by uh, Invercargill, and then Moiraki, up uh, by Wamaru, and all the way up to Kaikoura. So those are my iwi at the top there, Kaitahu, Kaitima Moe, and Waitaha. A linguistic trick. In the South Island, uh, an NG sound is a K, so if you're from the North Island Māori, that would be Ngaitahu, Ngatima Moe. But South Island Māori, we have a K instead. Um, I have an interesting, I think I'm one of the few people who has that range of majors and degrees. So I've got two degrees in, in, in combining Māori studies, mathematics and, and computer science. So I'm going to be talking about koha mostly and the community around it. Um, I'm working out Catalyst IT. It's the third company that I've worked on koha at, which I think is a quite neat open source story in itself. Um, I'm running away on Twitter and I'm that fellow who lost his bag on Sunday. If you saw my frantic tweets, my bag got off here and I got off at the residences. So it was kind of scary for about half an hour. Um, so what I'll start with is a brief, brief history of the Koha uh, software project more than the software itself. So this is the Levin Public Library as it looked in about uh, 19, uh, this, is, this is more like 2005, but that, it wouldn't look that much differently in 1999 when the project started. So it's a small, uh, if you know New Zealand at all, which some, most of you probably don't, so Levin is about an hour and a half north of Wellington. Uh, the library system they serve is Levin, Foxton, Shannon and a small town called Tokamaru. Um, and in about August of well, actually, earlier in the year, they'd realised that the system they were running had a Y2K problem. Uh, it was going to start issuing books to, I think, 69 or 70, which is great for revenue raising. You know, everything's 30 years out of uh, overdue. It's like, you owe us a million dollars, but um, not so good for actual usage. So they really liked the system, but it was proprietary, and the vendor had since disappeared, and no one could actually fix it, uh, you know. Um, so uh, they did what libraries do, they did an RFP process and vendors did what vendors do and didn't read the RFPs and put a bunch of answers in that wouldn't work. Um, so I was working for a little company called Katipo Communications. We got contracted to evaluate the responses and we kind of looked at them all and went none of these will work. Um, internet in New Zealand in 99 wasn't great, uh, especially in rural New Zealand. Um, we have electric fences. Um, Phone lines going over electric fences often you pick up the tick, tick, tick of the electric fence. So you can't really do very good compression. You can get to about 33K3. You try and compress it much more than that and the noise starts messing with your stuff. So also we have these other things, you probably have them here too, called rural modems, which is effectively like a modem with a megaphone attached to it. It just screams down the line to try and drown out that ticking noise. So never ever call a rural phone that has one of those on, you'll deafen yourself. So this was the situation. So we needed something that would work over slow lines. Um, all the solutions were like Citrix Metaframe based or Windows Terminal Server. We timed one, it took like a minute and a half to issue a book. I mean, Levin's small, but it's not that small. You know, you're gonna have more than one person a day coming into your library. Um, so Simon and I blame each other for this. One of us said, 
it's just a big database, how hard can it be? <laughs> um, which we've like owed each other's beers for, for years. Um, that was the genesis. So this was about September 99. We decided let's write a library system before January 3rd, 2000 when the library opened and the other one was going to not work anymore. We could have wound the clocks back, I guess, and bought ourselves a few more days. But so we, we did that. Um, the idea was we'd, well, I'll explain a little bit. Horofunua are part of a trust. They're a wholly owned council trust, but they have that one step away from being directly council controlled, which is why I think we were able to do this. Um, it was back in New Zealand, the National Library had just uh, blowing about oh, a couple of million dollars on a bespoke system that they canned. Um, so writing a bespoke system was not the in vogue thing to do. Um, yeah, so we said to them, look, there's 14 of us, we go on ski trips together, it's a windy road, there's a very good likelihood we're all going to go off at the corner in a bus at some point. You probably want to do something rather than get in the same situation you just were with a system you liked but you couldn't change. So we convinced them to open source it. The idea was that you know I wouldn't be supporting it from uh, 16 years later. <laughs> that bit didn't pan out, but at least there's 290 other people doing it as well. It's not just me. So that's where it started. Uh, we tidied it up, released it in about uh, June of 2000. Um, once I'd like had some sleep and cleaned up all of the horrible, horrible hacks I'd put in, in you know, the two days beforehand. I missed all the millennial fireworks. I'm going to have to stay alive for a thousand years. See the next lot. Um, but this is kind of a state of where it's in use now, and this is only the ones that I can be bothered finding GPS coordinates for, which is like hard work. So you can see there's a bit on the, on the right underneath the Ukraine, that's about Turkey there. There's a massive amount of there. Um, Koha runs every public library in Turkey. It's uh, 1,106 of them. And that's off a single installation, um, 14 servers, but single kind of cluster. Uh, we do the same in Argentina, but I did like five libraries that got bored. So um, if someone wants to, you can go on the site and add more GPS coordinates. <laughs> um, and yeah, masses of North America, um, not as much of Australia as it should, and not as much of New Zealand as it should. We're, we're, we're doing the... Um, the crowded house kind of thing. You have to go overseas and get famous before people will take you serious back home. Um, so yeah, and that's, oh, Alaska, we run lots more up there. So someone else has been adding things since last time I really looked at this. So um, some statistics about the project. We're now into, you know, more than that, because I ran that three days ago, so there'll be more now. So a lot of commits. Um, yeah, 295 different people have patches accepted to it. Um, we, one of the rules that we instigated um, that I really like is a rule that the Kohakon can't be in the same continent within three years, which forces it to move around the world. And so you get to go to places like Nigeria last year and um, Argentina and this year's Greece and stuff so that you probably wouldn't otherwise go. Um, the thing that I really like is that there's now 50 plus support companies, so there are people whose livelihoods are based on this. So not only are we automating libraries in Nigeria that may be automated for the first time ever, but there's three, well, two and two and a half, two support companies and a one person um, doing Koha support in Nigeria. There's one in Kenya, there's one in Malawi, um, and Vietnam, and all sorts. Actually, from um, Michael's talk reminded me, we did a, a neat thing with the Raspberry Pi. We've got Koha running on a Raspberry Pi. It's not super fast, but it works. And the way we do the um, upgrades is the way he does his SD cards. We just, they post an SD card back and you send another one out with the upgrade, you know? So the neat thing to do is you can, if you, you can make that into the wireless control, it can run your Wi-Fi as well and you can put a solar panel. It can just, you know, because uh, Nigeria at least has really unreliable um, power. Really good internet, but really unreliable power. Um, so what I found in the Kohakon last year in Nigeria is that they were like, well, our server gets hit by lightning. I was like, I, I, I can do some things with code. I'm not sure I can code around that. <laughs> you kind of need a hardware solution for that one. Um, and we're now in 30-ish in languages, including some neat ones like Urdu and um, 
Tamil and um, I forget what they speak in Timor, but that's one of the ones I've been translating and stuff as well. So, um, right, thanks, Brenda. Um, so I'm going to kind of like work my way through, and so the things I'm going to work about now is things that make me feel happy. Which in Don's case, is not a cat, but um, he'll forgive me for that. Um, so, like I said, the support companies. Uh, the, one of the things that I worked out the other day that English as a first language developers are now the minority. If you group all the others together, we're now the minority of the developers in the community, which I think is awesome. Um, another thing that's really neat is because libraries are a massively woman-dominated field and open source is a massively, sadly, massively male-dominated field still, um, when you combine the two, you end up with quite a good gender equity, kind of like gender equality balance just by accident. And then it becomes a self-fulfilling thing. Like when people see people like themselves in a community, then it's not so scary to join that community. Um, also, librarians are super organized. So we have a wiki that you can actually find things on, which is a <laughs> massive, <laughs> massive improvement over most of them. Um, and uh, one of the other things I think I was telling Molly the other day was, um, We've got, there's a, a, a Benedictine monk who used to work in, in IT who uh, now sends us security patches every so often. So we've got a monk doing security. I'd put it on a t-shirt, but we'd get hacked as soon as I did, I'm sure. That's asking for it. Uh, one of the people who sent uh, accessibility patch, he did, he did a whole lot of work on the staff client um, around uh, accessibility for visually impaired people as a blind uh, Buddhist monk. French guy lives now in, Tibet, maybe? I've lost track of him. He's, you get a patch from him whenever he has internet at some point. <laughs> uh, he's working his way around installing it in libraries as part of his karmic build-up kind of thing. So that's cool. Um, I, it may be one of the few software projects I know that have you know, a Buddhist monk and a Benedictine monk sending patches. But there is a Trappist monk as well who I keep trying to get to send me beer, but he's not taking the hint yet. Um, <laughs> um, you know, I'll pretty much add any feature you ask for for it. <laughs> but yeah, so there's, there's that. Um, one of the things kind of closer to home was that uh, a few years ago they had those horrible floods in Queensland and, and a couple of libraries ended up underwater, um, including well, one of them, in one of their cases, the machine room, which had their koha on it. Um, so the really neat thing that happened then was there's... there's uh, a little company in um, Sydney called Calix, which are a uh, Koha support private provider here in Australia. They just like down tools and turned up and them and, and a few other librarians who ran Koha kind of just pitched in and got the catalogue and everything up and running again from backups from the two, you know, so they were, once the books dried out, they were able to, <laughs> to, to, to do it again. Yeah, so the, uh, unfortunately libraries generally put their really important stuff down the bottom where it's cooler. Um, so yeah, that's the place that gets flooded too. Um, so there was that. And then to contrast, this is putting in perspective kind of the second half of my talk. We still have to deal with things that make sad cats. Um, <laughs> that's a great picture, isn't it? <laughs> so um, yeah, we, we, we've had interesting tension between uh, commercial, well, Koha's always been a commercial product, uh, project anyway. People have always made money off it, but, but companies trying to, to take leadership over the whole project as a whole. And I don't know if any of you are aware of like a, uh, well, it'll be about three years, no, 2010, Liblime, um, which is a, a, a company in the States, got bought by another company, which is a, do most of their work as defense contractors, so they come in pretty hard and fast. Um, so they registered the tra tried to register the trademark in New Zealand, which I felt really guilty for because that was a massive piece of naivety on my part. I thought koha is a Māori word, common usage. You can't trademark that. Turns out you can trademark whatever the hell you want. Um, you just have to trademark it in the field you're in. So it was trademarked for library, comma, software, comma, something else. Um, so we had to then fight that, which was a massive amount of uh, energy expended uh, and we still have a, a problem today because they own the koha.org domain, don't go there, it's the wrong one. So we've got koha community.org 
Um, eventually, I, they're quite, I don't want to say incompetent, yeah, well, they're quite incompetent, so sooner or later they'll forget to renew the domain. Uh, they've done it on at least three of the other ones, so. And, and they've rebranded their product, so hopefully that whole kind of confusion has come away. They're calling it Bibliovation now. That's Koha. Yeah, it's Koha from five years ago. Um, so, and also with the upside of being a community with quite diverse ethnic uh, contributors, um, comes cross-cultural and cross-linguistic communication issues. Um, one of the ones I used to bump into when I was younger and, and less wise, I guess, well, more stupid. No, <laughs> I don't know. But I, I would get emails from some French developers, and when they wrote English, they wrote it in quite an active voice. Um, and to a New Zealander, where we tend to be quite passive in the way we phrase, it sounded like they were demanding things all the time. So I'd instantly read their email an entirely wrong way. Like, I'd read it as if they were angry with me, when in fact they were just, that was just how they were talking. Like, if it had been in French and I'd translated it, and maybe I would have gone, oh, it's a translation thing. But because it was in English, I just assumed that they were meh. So that caused unnecessary problems, so which we learned from. Um, and uh, there's, there's a lot of, we, 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 Koha is quite widely used in some places who have different views about the roles of women and men and things like that. So there's that tension that you have to navigate and those kind of things as well. So the whole genesis of this, of this talk was I got asked to do a talk last year uh, at a conference in New Zealand called OSOS, which is Open Source Open Society, and they gave me a topic about can the, can the can we create, no, it was massively long, I can't remember it, but it was about will the commons, like creating a strong commons in 20 years time, will that survive, you know, how will that make society look, will that um, be our saviour kind of thing. Um, and I couldn't, I like thought yes, no, maybe, so like, I can't answer that, that's like not a 20 minute talk. So I went off on this, the, what, the second half of this talk here, which is a, which was kind of interesting because in Jono's talk I was sitting there thinking, as technologists we often think everything we do is new. Um, building communities isn't new. Um, we can take a lot of lessons from how people have built physical communities, how people have kept Fano, hapo, like their family groups, their wider things strong over thousands of years. There's lots of lessons there. We don't have to reinvent everything. Um, the medium may be different, but some of the techniques and the ways of communicating are the same. So I kind of built in this, this idea of, well, let's look back. And so the easiest way to look back is look back through your own stuff. So I look back through my, um, my upbringing and my grandparents. And we go back 47 generations in, in New Zealand, which is long for New Zealand. It's nothing for Australia. But <laughs> like the indigenous people here go back a lot longer. But for us, that, that was quite good. So I, we, and we've been. Māori have only been colonised for 166 years, yeah. So there's still more of that traditional, it hasn't all been lost yet. So I look back through some of that. So I'm going to start off with um, some proverbs that, that you'll often hear in a Māori setting. So the first one is nā te rauro, nā taku rauro, ka ora, iti with your basket and my basket will feed the people. So, you know, it's that sharing kind of idea. Um, e hara taku toa e te toa takitahi, engari he toa takitini. The strength of me is not the strength of one, it's the strength of many. Uh, things I do are not done by myself, they're done by the collective. Um, standing on the shoulder of giants, those kind of ideas. So you can see there's overlap and stuff already happening. He waka eke noa, a canoe everyone can be in. Inclusivity, diversity. There's a there's a role for everyone in a walker. Uh, you need someone steering, you need strong people at the back, you need other people who have got good rhythm in the middle, and you can have, so everyone has a role in there. So it's uh, another analogy, I don't know that you guys are all, I don't know, if you're from Victoria, you're probably more into football, but in New Zealand, a lot of Māori into uh, rugby is our kind of pastime. So I, I call uh, 
IT kind of the rugby of the jobs. There's a, there's a position for every person. <laughs> like, that's the thing with rugby. Every body type, every kind of skill set, there's a position for you. Um, Matini ma mano karapu te whai. Many hands make light work. That's basically that one. So there's, and you can see where this came from. Like, so th these are people who have come, some say from Malaya, not really sure, but if you follow Kumara back, that's probably where they came from. Over thousands of years to New Zealand, um, mostly been through quite warm climates where their crops grow really fast and well and stuff. And then you're in the South Island of New Zealand, which is freezing cold and nothing grows and there's no land mammals and you know, there's not a lot of food sources. Working together becomes supremely important. So they developed a lot of these rules and guidelines on how to, to stop conflict between yourselves because otherwise, you know, the, the iwi will just perish. So another one that I really like, and you often hear people, if you've been to New Zealand, you'll hear the word mana and people often uh, translate it to be respect, but it's, it's a lot more than that. It's a, a, there's lots of different types of mana, but this is a quote that I really like in that the money you get, the, uh, I don't want to say, prestige, I don't know, it comes from the people around you, not, not you. you know, the, the more you connect with the others, the, the more respect you should be accorded. It's not, it doesn't come necessarily from your deeds, those are perhaps a side effect, but it's, it's more that the more connected you are to others. So that's kind of a, a nice, um, I think that's a nice principle for an open source project to follow as well. Um, try and help as many people as you can. Try and, uh, try and recognize their humanness. Try and be inclusive. Try and um, find something they can do. Um, uh, someone said in the, I can't remember who said it, uh, but it was a really good point in the um, Community Leadership Summit the other day that often people's first patch or first contribution is testing the community to see how they'll get a reaction. And you can, that, you know, how you react to that first patch, you either turn them into a long time contributor or someone who's gonna bad mouth you to everyone they meet. You know, there's, there's, you've got a massive opportunity at that point. Um, and if you remember this manatanga, we're all people, we're the sum total of who came before us um, and treat them that way, then you're less likely to make a horrible mistake. Um, Whakanuia, recognising contributions. This is a jar of peanut butter that I got sent by someone in the States. They found out my wife loves Jif peanut butter, which as far as I can tell is uh, more sugar than peanuts. Um, <laughs> but apparently choosy mums like it, so I don't know. Uh, but she, that, this is something that they just, they, they, I signed off on, on her patch and she sent me a jar of peanut butter in the mail and I have signed off on every single patch she's done afterwards. <laughs> it, it, it works really well, simple things like that, and they just grow that, the community and stuff together. So recognising contributions, sometimes in a tangible, sometimes in an intangible way. Another thing I do in the Koha community, I, I, I do blog posts which I call Unsung Heroes of Koha, where I try and find people who are doing stuff behind the scenes that people don't realise they're doing and highlight that. Sometimes the person or sometimes just the action if they don't want to be. A lot of those people doing stuff behind the scenes don't really want to be recognised. And, you know, they don't want their name out there, so you just recognise what they're doing. People, can, people who know, know. Um, and that, I think, is a good thing. And this, this happened in, in the Whakanui is a, is a principle of um, learning in, in Māori. You went into a whare wānanga, a, a classroom, and you were rewarded. It was... If you've ever trained puppies, it's, you know, reward the good, ignore the bad. Fucking New Year's that kind of principle. So reward good behaviour and you get more of it. Send me peanut butter, I'll sign off your patches. <laughs> I'll take biscotti as well. And Trappist beer, if the monkeys, <laughs> if you're watching on the live stream. <laughs> I should do that. <laughs> so, kayako pono. Kayako, kayako is, is uh, Ako is to learn, if you put kai in front of a word, you make it into the action of learning, or in this case, teaching. And pono means the, the tikanga, the process of it. So this is mentorship. Okay. Um, and it's again that kind of 
bringing people in. Um, one of the, we've got a whole set of rules on how a first patch from someone should be treated. And like, if they accidentally put some tabs in instead of four spaces, now's not the time to go and have a rant about tabs in four spaces. <laughs> Just fix it. It's not that hard. <laughs> fix it yourself. Sign off the patch. If everything else works, um, and maybe put a little note. I fixed your tabs into spaces, and here's uh, what editor to use. Here's the Vim config you could use, or here's such and such. You know, to to, to stop that. There's even a uh, there's a little Git hook that will do that for you and stuff as well. So you can point them down that way. But yeah, um, there's no hero. There's no prizes for scaring someone off over something as silly as white space. Um, um, this, the, there's a, Esther Schindler, uh, is, she wrote a really interesting article, which I should have linked on here, but if you Google for it, you'll probably find it, uh, about open source mentorship stuff. Um, and I find it a really rewarding experience, and I'm fundamentally lazy, so if I can train people to do the stuff that I'm doing, then I don't have to do it, and I can go and drink Trappist beer and eat peanut butter. Um, but that's kind of the thing. It's like it's a massive, like a massive buzz for me when someone I've been helping doesn't need my help anymore. That's a that's a great feeling. Um, the other principle of that Māori do a lot. Uh, some would say argue, but <laughs> I like to say discuss. Um, often in a marae setting or in a in a, in a group setting. Um, we work in a consensus kind of model, like you'll talk the issue around and around and around until people, enough people don't object to it anymore. You don't have to all agree with it, but it's talking around and around and around. Uh, usually with food. So this is Argentina. You should come to Coahuacan, so awesome. Um, this is Argentina uh, in Jesus Maria, um, a little town out of there, and there's a bunch of uh, three French, no, Two Belgians and a French, uh, Argentinian, I can't remember, Joy's American. But yeah, we we're all sitting around a table discussing things. And those discussions about, like, should we re change our templating system and all those kind of things, um, having active and healthy discussions around it rather than we're going to do this um, means that you often end up with, if it goes wrong, there's less blame. If it goes right, you share the, the credit. Um, Food is a massive part of Māori culture as well. Um, so everything would either start with food or end with food. Or, so it's good I'm going into lunch afterwards, perfect. Um, and um, that means I don't have to buy you all food, so that's, that's good. Um, uh, and so yeah, talking and stuff. Uh, often um, the interesting thing is I'm trying to find a picture of us talking and every single one of them has bottles of wine on the table. So that's maybe something we need to work on. I think I, I'm blaming the, um, Paul. He always brings really good French wine, so you can't not drink it, really, can you? Um, but yeah, those discussions, translating the. F in, in, in Māori, then we have a thing saying, kanuhi te kite kanuhi, face to face. Doing these face to face pe things means that when Paul and I have an argument about, uh, well, you shouldn't do nested ifs or whatever st stupid thing that we think is important at that point in time. Um, <laughs> We, we, we've got this person behind the email address. You know, that, that going back to that mana tangata, it's all about humanising, it's all about treating people as people, not um, IRC nicks. And the last one is again, leading on from that quarter to quarter. So these are my boys. I was trying to find a, a, a photo for consensus, and I've left this in there because I've since found other ones, but I like this one. Um, because I, I asked, so I was asking my kids, is like, how would you show people agreeing? And Kahu, who's my oldest on the left there, said, just have a photo of me hugging my brother. So I was like, <laughs> there we go, sorted. So, so consensus is where you hopefully get to after these discussions. And hopefully everyone's ending up hugging, but that doesn't, uh, doesn't necessarily always end up that way. Um, but that's what you're trying to work, work towards. So. I'm running a bit sh fast on time, but I don't think you'll mind lunch too early, but I'll, I'll take lots of questions if you like. But the last kind of, well, there's a couple of slides left. But the, you'll notice the title, the title of my talk was Hiahate Mia Nui. 
So um, you can read the, I won't read it out, but I'll explain to you what this means while you're reading it. So flax, if you, I don't know, does Australia have flax? It probably does. So flax grows from the middle out. So child grows in the middle, splits parents, grandparents, great grandparents, child keeps growing up the middle, right? Cut the middle, the flax plant dies. So that whole kind of idea of what's the most important thing, who's coming after you, what are we doing stuff for? It's the shoots growing up through the middle. Um, and it, 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 you'll, you'll often, it, you can sing it, I'm not going to, I've got a horrible singing voice. Uh, you can ask the Nigerians who I sang uh, the boxer on karaoke and I'm sure they're still hating, like that. don't ever let them back in the country. Um, Lie, 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 it just keeps going at the end, like for ages. Um, it's a horrible song, never do it. <laughs> um, yeah, so the, there's this idea, so I'm trying to bring it all back in, is that every, it's all about the people. Like, so that's why I've kind of consciously not talked about the, the software itself. It, it runs a library, but that's the least important part of the project. The, the important part is that it's empowered people all over, all over the world to have access to knowledge, to be able to contribute to things, to be able to grow themselves, um, to be able to be involved in a software project and stuff. Um, so just before I take questions, in uh, New Zealand today we just had a pretty shitty treaty signed, but perhaps in Australia you might consider a new kind of treaty being signed that's not quite as shitty. <laughs> that's how I just wanted to finish it. Okay, so I'm willing to take 20 minutes of questions or 15. <laughs> <laughs> Helen? Um, my question is when you say that you have non, um, a lot of non English mm -hmm. speakers, did you have to re de redesign it to accept, um, say, non English characters? Like non as a so, so the question is, we have a lot of non-English users. Do we have to uh, redesign to accept non-English characters? And, the, and the, the short answer is sort of. Um, because we started with it being bilingual, making it trilingual is a lot easier than going from monolingual to bilingual. So we already had Unicode. Perl, it's written in Perl, and Perl does a lot of things that people don't like. But one of the things that I really like is it has about the best Unicode support of any language out there. Um, so we already had Unicode in there for the Macrons in Māori. So what we had to do, though, was when we hit right to left, which there was a really good talk on earlier in the week, uh, you have to do quite a bit of work around right to left languages. Um, luckily, CSS has come a long way from 99 when we first started. So a lot of that you can do with CSS or do a lot of it for you. Um, we have a, a separate project called translate.kohakimmunity.org, which uses a French I think it's French, a piece of software called Pootle, P-O-O-T-L-E, which uh, deals with .po files. I don't know if any of you have done localization, you will have bumped into them. So we've got a script that strips our templates out, makes .po files, we upload it there, they translate it, and we regenerate. So we don't do on-the-fly translation. Um, it's a legacy of being started in that long ago when it was slow. So you didn't want to be trying to translate templates on the fly. So we pre-render all the templates. Um, we might try and change it and do something a bit cooler now, but yeah. My dad's a linguist, so he gives me a lot of help around that kind of stuff. Russian's his first language, well, second language after English. Hello? Uh, we touched on this in CLS, mm -hmm. and we touched on it now, and that is how do we, how we learn from these ancient people. Right. Trust you to ask the really hard question. So Donna, <laughs> Donna just asked me, so, so we've got this, these ancient communities and stuff around, and how do we learn from them? How do we stop reinventing the wheel? Um, I don't know, have you looked at people's, we, we're pretty good at reinventing the wheels. Uh, <laughs> um, no, I, I, I think the trick is finding an in to those communities. That is the hardest part. Um, for, for a lot of my non-Māori friends, the easiest way to do that is have a Māori friend. But if you can't do that, the second easiest way to do that is um, volunteer at things. Turn up where, where Māori are going to be. Uh, see if you can help. Um, 
if you know there's a like there's going to be a bunch of festivals on in Wellington. It's Waitangi Day um, on Saturday, which is um, the anniversary of the signing of the Treaty of Waitangi. Um, turn up to those kind of events, mingle around, wash some dishes out the back, do those kind of things. It's a long process. Uh, there's years and years of mistrust generally between the colonised and the colonisers. Uh, you're not going to undo all of that yourself, but at least if you show you're a person and you're a good person and you want to do things, then you make those contacts and then those contacts make other contacts. And I think we, we were trying to talk about it the other day. It's, it's finding someone receptive and then building from there, um, starting small. Yeah. Um, regarding your last slide, yes. you just mentioned Waitangi. Mm -hmm. And how, I mean, I'm from Australia. Yeah. How important is Waitangi, do you think, to day to day life in New Zealand in the light of the culture? Oh, another really tricky question one. Um, <laughs> I did an entire paper on this. Um, <laughs> So the, the question is, um, how important is, is the Treaty of Waitangi in day-to-day -day life in New Zealand? I can't speak for everyone, so I'll speak for myself. For me, uh, it is our founding document. Um, it is what gives non-Māori the right to be in New Zealand. It's what accords them the right to be governed by uh, a non-Māori government. Um, but also, it doesn't, in my opinion, it doesn't cede sovereignty. There's a difference between governorship and sovereignty. But So in day-to-day -to -day -to -day life, um, it doesn't have a massive effect, um, but what it has meant is that there has been some remediation to some of the treaty breaches. We do, we are trying as a country, for the most part, to make things better. So there are settlements, there are, I mean, no, not, the whole of New Zealand is not going to come back. So my iwi from South Island, uh, there's some really interesting pictures of the land acquisitions over about 15 years. Um, who got back maybe about a thousandth of what they lost, but that's better than zero, you know. Um, and even that was contentious, but uh, they've turned it into a lot more. Um, I think that it's, yeah, it, it, I think it's something to be proud of, but it's something that we need to work on every day as well. Um, you'll know, that you, if you look at the newspapers over the next couple of days, you'll see a bunch of people moaning about bloody Maoris ruining our barbecue stuff, you know. I'm sure you get over here for Australia Day and stuff as well. At the back. Um, you talked about how the project actually started mm -hmm. in the library. Um, I'm just wondering if you could talk what happened after you implemented right. the discovery, like how the commitment, how it grow? Okay, yep. yep. So the question is, um, I talked a bit about how the project started in the library and then I kind of jumped forward 16 odd years. So how, how do we, so, how did the project grow and stuff from, from being first in the library? Um, I'll answer that by first saying, the, the, the other bit that I just want to tell you, which just reminded me, is the way I built this, I had no library software, no, no library training. So what I did was I'd work the day in the library and then I'd go and write stuff in the evening, like try and replicate what I see, saw the system doing. But yeah, so, what we, so the librarians really liked it at that library because it did exactly what they wanted um, because I just made it do what they wanted. It's like, it, so we didn't have any of this plan it all out kind of thing. Um, but after, it took a little while. The first, the really interesting thing for me was the first uh, patch that came from outside of, of the little company I worked for was from General Motors and they were using it to catalog all their manuals which um, they'd just found it and done it and so they added like rudimentary journal support which was really cool and then um, it grew like I said it grew much more outside of New Zealand which is not what I expected I thought like we'd we'd build this thing and it works perfectly for a small system in New Zealand and all the small libraries in New Zealand would take none of them touched it um, one, one even said in about 2005 I think Danny Burke is about 15,000 people if that said, oh, we're too big for um, Koha. Meanwhile, Delhi Public had just installed it like the week before. It's like, you want to talk orders of magnitude? <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> they do more in a day than those guys circulate in two years. But, but you know, there's this, there's this interesting cultural cringe in New Zealand around stuff that comes from New Zealand. Um, so it, it, it grew, and then a guy in, in uh, BC in Canada, Tonnes, took it up.
drifted into the coastal mountain school district there. And then he was really, really good at talking about it, much better than I was. And so he started talking about it. He was an early blogger. He was, and he, because he was in the education thing, they read a lot. So it did spread around um, really fast in that kind of sector. Um, yeah, we really didn't know what we, it was. If there had been an existing project, we would have taken it. This was the first kind of source that the, the company was at had started. We had no idea how to build it. It kind of just happened. Um, but I think the okay, uh, the think the thing that was like I said that the fact that we had a really good start with a, a decent gender equity. We had librarians controlling the development of the software. Meant that people really saw it as, hey, this will actually work for us because we're not buying something that someone thinks will work for us, we're, we're taking something that is proven to work for libraries. Does that kind of answer it? Yeah. Oh, good. Hi, Jill. Um, cultural items like physical cultural items, I gather, can be awesome catalogs mm -hmm. um, Do you know anything about this? Um, there was some, a return to New Zealand of some particularly significant cultural items. Um, well, they ca ended up being catalogued in another system. Yeah. So, um, the question was, uh, you can catalogue uh, physical items, well, you can catalogue anything um, in, into a library system, and there was recently some um, fairly significant cultural items returned to New Zealand. Are they catalogued in Koha? No. Um, they'll probably be in some archival or gallery software. Uh, the, there's, there's a lot of different software around for that. Uh, there's one called Archive Space and one called Collection Space. It's an uh, open source ones that do those kind of things as well. I imagine they'll be in some proprietary thing though. Um, archives are traditionally really good at building stuff for themselves, so they'll probably have something they built themselves and it'll be catalogued in there. But yeah, what that, it's interesting you brought up that you catalog anything. One of the other early users was a video store that used Koha to catalog all of their collection. And then they had an online, like what in the library world we call it an OPAC, an uh, online public access catalog. Horrible acronym, no one knows what it means. But th it? that's what it means, oh. see? Um, okay. and, then, and then they had that, and people at home could place a reserve on the, the video they wanted, it was videos back then, um, and then go into the store and get it. And this was like groundbreaking things. Um, so they used the, the software for that. So it's been, you know, bent into different shapes. Grant? One of the things that I think people might do argue about is the license fee. Mm -hmm. Is that ever been an issue in Yes. Yeah, uh, we made okay choices. So the, the question was, uh, People often like to argue about licenses. Has that come up in the community? And did we make good choices? We picked GPL version 2 or later, which was a good choice, I think, because it was easy to go to GPL 3 um, when that came out. And so Koha at the moment is GPL 3 or later. I would quite like it to be a GPL. Um, that's still quite contentious inside um, the community, mostly I feel because we haven't really talked about it enough, I think there's more misunderstanding, we're, we're, we're talking past each other a lot of the time. Um, but after, after Liblime kind of forked and off and uh, did their software as a service version and stuff, the AGPL became a lot more uh, tempting at that point. Um, because as everything moves more to hosted or in the cloud or whatever you want to call it, someone else's computer, um, you, this, this, the, having it AGPL, meaning that you actually still can get your software, you know, so that when they fold, if they fold, it's a good thing. Um, yeah, we, 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 it comes up at every core hike on. We have like a, a mini birds of a feather argue about licensing. Um, well, I think it'll go to AGPL at some point. The thing, the trick you can do with once you have GPL version 3 it, is if someone submits something under AGPL v3, that everyone wants and you bundle it, then the rest is AGPL version 3. It's, it's, a, it's a workaround. <laughs> um, yeah, sorry. Okay. Uh, Jill? Oh, I was just going to say, so who actually owns the copyright on the copyright? Uh, we haven't done uh, 
what do they call it when you do assignment? Yeah. So it, it's everyone, like all, all sorts of people, which actually really helped us when, when, when um, Liblime lost their minds. Okay, so you have to set up like the Co-Half Foundation or something like that. It's looked after by um, uh, a, a private, what's it called? Public, no, it's a private trust in New Zealand. Right. Looks after the trademarks and the EU mark and stuff now, but doesn't really, we don't assign copyright to it. So how did you do the change from BGN? Because oh, okay. it just works, it's all later. Oh, yeah. So as long as you've got the all later in there, you're all good. Yeah, Clinton, you had a question? Right. Um, it was kind of, yeah, I think it's, oh, sorry. The, the question was, was the, the culture something that you did at work and so it just flowed into the project or was it something uh, intrinsic, I guess? Or, and how do you get other people to um, join and become part of that common culture? Um, it kind of was something at work, but not really. Um, for a while there, I've, at least four or five months I was the only developer on it so it was just kind of me um, after, after we finished it like looking after it until June um, I don't know it's it, I don't quite know how it happened but I think a lot of it had to, the, to do with the fact that it's to do with libraries and librarians are just lovely people and um, they their whole roles are to be welcoming and sharing and stuff so it kind of just grew in that kind of way and so I, I have a, uh, John had touched on it leading by example. If you, if, if, you, if, you look, if you watch the community for a bit and you see how everyone interacts with themselves, you, you tend to do it that way. We'd get people that come in and you know, are, are toxic and you have to deal with them. But generally, um, most people come in kind of the way they've seen other people come in, if that makes sense. So I don't think, it's not really a deliberate thing, it just kind of happens. Yeah. Um, 